in our covenant week of new beginnings as a church. And this is very significant. That's why I said we will take some time to look at what God is doing with us. We've come to the end of a year, but we are pressing into a new year. And I just don't want you to cross into 2014 like you have crossed into every year. This year will be different for you. I said this new year will be a different one for you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Destroy the earth by a flood again. And he told Noah that in Genesis chapter 8, from verse 21 and 22. There was a time Jesus saw a woman that was caught in adultery. And she was going to be stoned to death. And Jesus said to her, uh, he said to the people, that the person that does not have a sin should be the first to cast a stone. And everybody dropped their stones and left. And the next thing Jesus was going to say to this woman is, has no one condemned you? The woman said, no, Lord. And he said to her, he said, neither do I condemn you, but I give you a new beginning. Go and sin no more. You are released from what should have killed you, but don't continue in sin. So God is always looking for opportunities to give new beginnings. With the children of Israel, after their deliverance from Egypt, he said through prophet Isaiah, we read a little bit of that uh, when Pastor Toby was giving us the charge. And I just want to Quickly go back to Isaiah chapter 40, 48, 43 from verse 15. Isaiah chapter 43 from verse 15. He said, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Go back to verse 15, please. I am the Lord. That is what makes him sovereign. Somebody say he is the Lord. He is the Lord. I am your creator. That's what makes him the one who made you. Say, he made me. He made me. The Holy One. That's what makes him the example. Somebody say, my example. My example. And then your king. That's what gives him rulership over your life. Somebody say, my ruler. My ruler. Now, God described himself in four ways. He said, I am the Lord. I am the Holy One. I am the creator of Israel and your king. Why? So that no matter how you think of him, no matter how you look at him, he is fully in charge of all that concerns you. I don't want you to think when God is making a promise, it's like a man making a promise to you. Numbers chapter 23 verse 19 tells us that God is not a man that he should lie, neither is he the son of man that he should repent. Has he not promised and can he not make it good? So when God says something and he's describing himself as the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator, the King, he's saying to you that what I am telling you I'm able to do, I have not only the authority, I also have the power. Amen. Amen. So he has authority, he has the power, and when he says he's going to do something, he has everything it takes for it to happen. And so this is why he said this through the prophet. And verse 16. Now he now begins to say, verse 16. He said, Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters. You know, it is not easy to look at a sea and just see it part for people to cross over on dry land. He is only, he's the only God that can do that. The Bible says he made a path through the mighty waters. And verse 17 tells us, He brings forth, he brings forth his the chariot and horse and the army and the power. They shall lie down together, they shall not rise. They are extinguished, they are quenched like a wick. Verse 18. That same God says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. You know why he was making an emphasis on you having to forget the things of old? Because when you are about to enter into a new year, and you are having all the high hopes of what God is able to do in your life, and you are having all the high expectations, the next thing the enemy will be reminding you is that do you know that this was how you had the high expectations crossing over from 2012 to 2013? And he will begin to remind you how you thought God was going to come through for you in 2013 in that area. And how you actually thought he was going to come through for you in 2012 and nothing happened. And then he will begin to tell you, why are you fooling yourself? It's not going to happen again. God said, don't remember those things. What I want you to do is not to consider the things of old. I want you to listen to what I'm saying to you because I am your Lord. I am your creator. I am your holy one. I am the one who is your king. 
If you put your trust in me, then I am able to do something. That's why verse 19 now says, Behold, verse 19, Behold, somebody say behold. behold. The word behold there means see, comprehend, come to a place of understanding, a place of acceptance, a place of submission, a place where you will no longer think about the former things, but just say I am comprehending what God is about to do. He said, I will do a what? A new thing. Say, God will do a new thing in my life. It shall spring forth. I will know it. God will make a road for me in the wilderness. He will make rivers for me in the desert places. Hallelujah. God is saying this not because you need a road per se, a physical road. But God is saying to you that what is the wilderness experience that you are passing through now? What is it that you are passing through in life that looks like something that you cannot overcome? He is saying to you, I am the Lord. I am the Holy One. His holiness means he cannot lie. His holiness means he cannot sin. His holiness means he cannot deceive. I was in a church, 2007 through 2008, and we had an awesome seminar. I was privileged to be one of the speakers there. I wasn't the pastor, senior pastor of the church, just one of the leaders. And uh, powerful, powerful crossover service. I ministered by privilege in one of the sessions, and we had a couple of other ministers. Powerful sessions. And my goodness, I thought we had really dealt with the devil crossing over into a new year. And then the first service we had was just about three days. The first Sunday service we had was just about three days into the new year. And I remember we missed a large hall. And then they called for people to come forward for ministration. If people had problems. And I could not believe my eyes. Three days into a new year, after all that prophetic, heavy dealing with the devil, people were coming out in droves and coming out in droves. And as, and, and as I was I was worshipping, and then somehow I was looking in the physical, but God opened my eyes in the spirit to see how people were holding on to big bags that they let they refused to let go. God told me, He said, they did not allow me to take them away, despite everything I said to them on the cross of night. And I saw people very tightly fisting in the spirit, holding on to those big bags of junk and baggages. And God showed me again how people will come to service, bring those bags at the beginning of a service, put it in the front of the altar, all in the spirit. And everybody will sing and dance and feel light and feel happy and feel glad. And as soon as the benediction is given and everyone is going home, people will go back to the front and look for their bags and carry them again and start going home with them. And God is saying there must be a change. Yeah. He's saying there must be a change of heart. Yeah. He said, my people must believe me for who I am. If I say, cast your cares upon me because I care for you, it simply means that whatever it is, if you put your trust in me, you don't have to go back home with it. Yeah. Hallelujah. Somebody say he will do a new thing. I want you to be fired up for 2014 because I will be telling you what God is laying on my heart as to what 2014 is for us. You must be a fired up person to walk in the fullness of the anointing of the word that God is giving our way. And I believe it will make it happen for you in the mighty name of Jesus. Friends, I want you to know that God makes destiny happen for all people, no matter the seeming setbacks or obstacles. No matter what you think you have gone through, no matter how you have been labeled, no matter how life must have dealt with you, I want you to know that your destiny is not in the hand of any man. Your destiny is not in the hand of any system. Your destiny is not restricted to a geographic location. Your destiny is not restricted to your passport. Your destiny is in the hand of the Almighty God. Your Holy One, your Creator. That's who He is. Let's not make Him who He is not. He is no man. He is no man. He is God. And that is all. He said, I am the Lord. That is my name. Is there anything so difficult for me? He said, behold, I am the Lord. There is nothing that is difficult for me to do. Hallelujah. Jeremiah got a comprehension of it at a point. He said, ah, Lord God, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power 
and your outstretched hands. Behold, there is nothing that is difficult for you to do. And I pray that your faith in this God will be ignited this morning. Yeah. In the mighty name of Jesus. Yeah. He makes destiny happen. Look at a man called Moses. We won't read the story now, but I'll quickly paraphrase. Exodus chapter 1, he was born. And the Bible says that he was seen as a goodly child. So much so that when children that were born like him, from his own background, were being killed, his mother hid him. And uh, we know what happened? Put him in a, in a little uh, um, basket. basket, like you, and put him by the river. And uh, somehow, God floated to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's uh, um, uh, temple, the kingdom. And in the, in the place where Pharaoh was living, the, the, the daughter found the, the, the child and took him. And Pharaoh began to take care of the one who was going to deal with him later on. Somebody say destiny. They were feeding him, putting muscles into him, giving him bodybuilding exercises, training him about the ways of Egypt. Telling him all the secrets of the magical acts and everything he needed to know so that when God was going to send him back, he would have no problem comprehending what God was doing. So is it destiny? As at Exodus chapter 2, it looked as if that destiny was going to be truncated and aborted. He took things into his hands, he killed an Egyptian, and you know what happened? He became a fugitive, he had to run away. And at that point, it looked as if the story of Moses had ended. For 40 years, nobody heard about Moses again. You might be in a situation where it looks as if God told you something 5 years ago, 10 years ago, and it looks as if nothing is happening now. I want you to know that it's just a wilderness. He's making a way. Yeah. He's making a way. Yeah. Like he made his way and he found his way back to Moses' life. He's going to find his way back to your life. Yeah. And he's going to call you forth and say, come my son, come my daughter. Now is the time for the thing I've spoken to you. Yeah. In the name of Jesus. Yeah. Whatever you see me doing today, it didn't happen yesterday. The first time you spoke to me about this assignment and the many more things to come was in 1998. And for many years, it looked as if, God, what is happening? I don't know what I'm going to do about this. But one step after the time, so what is it line upon line? Precept upon precept. Some of the experiences were very tough. Very tough. At times, I was left all alone by myself. Felt very, very alone. But I still remembered that he spoke to me. God in is, is not a man that he should lie. I want you to know that whatever you have heard from him before has power in itself to make it come to pass. Amen. Say the word of God has power in itself to make itself come to pass. He's the only one that can speak a word and make it happen. He's the only one. And so I want you to be confident in God this year. By Exodus chapter 3, God appeared back to Moses and said to him, Come, I'm sending you back to Pharaoh, where you used to be a fugitive, where nobody wanted to deal with you, where they were even trying to kill you. I'm sending you back there, not just for you to report, but you to become a God. Exodus chapter 7 verse 1, he says, See, I have made you. He used the same word, behold. He said, Behold, I have made you a God to Pharaoh. God will make you a God to every tormentor. Amen. He will make you a God to everything challenging your destiny. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You are looking for a job. You are becoming an employer. You are not just going to stay looking for a job. You are becoming an employer. Yeah. That's what he said. Hallelujah. He says, see, I have made you a God to Pharaoh. How can you make somebody a God to somebody he was a fugitive from? Somebody he was running away from? It only takes God to come in at the time he has appointed, at the time he has ordained, and he will surely come in for you in Jesus' name. Amen. The great man, Winston Churchill, one of the most prominent prime ministers to ever rule this country, gone down into history as a hero. His story goes, he has a lot about his story, but I'll just tell you a little bit about it, which ties into what we're saying today has the fact that he became one of the youngest cabinet ministers in his time at 33 years old. He was one of the most prominent and he was a very prolific speaker. He had those very powerful phrases he used to speak. And um, Winston Churchill at a time 
was sensing the fact that an of Hilda was really raging and was going to become a terror. But people could not comprehend. Everybody was saying the message of peace was going to work. And Winston was standing for the principle that it was time to confront Hitler with everything he was trying to do to terrorize the world. But everybody else saw Winston as a troublemaker. As a matter of fact, they threw him out of the cabinet. <laughs> Praise God. You know, when you go against the grain, you, you are likely to be thrown out of the cabinet. <laughs> Amen. So he was thrown out. But history has it that this man, nothing was heard of him until he was about 65 years of age. Then Hitler actually started dealing with the world. And World War II was about to begin. And the king of this great nation had to send for Winston Churchill personally and ask him to form a government. Because the king recognized that this is what this young man was saying many years ago. They threw him out and they, did not, they made light of him. But now I will use my sovereignty as king to ask him to form a government for me. And with the church itself, for the first time, he felt the weight of the whole world fall on his shoulders. He suddenly felt that God is now committing the destiny of so many to so few. Because he could see that the destiny of the world was going to be in what England and what Great Britain was going to be able to do against the forces of Adolf Hitler. And this was what became the story of the man. The moment when it seemed as if everything about him had finished. 65 years is normally the age you should go into retirement. But that was the age they came back to make him Prime Minister. My God will come back for you. Yeah. I said he will come back for you. Yeah. In the mighty name of Jesus. Yeah. He went on to say things like difficulties mastered are opportunities won. Never see a difficulty as anything that is insurmountable. Every challenge you have in life today, somebody said challenges are breakfast of champions. They are the things that you should feast on in order to be able to make progress. Don't let anything limit you any further. God is taking your life to higher dimensions in the mighty name of Jesus. He was so defiant and tough when he began to mobilize the, Bible, the, 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 the history talks about him as mobilizing English language. He would be speaking tough. He did not know what he had. He was not sure, but he knew that with confidence. He said, we will fight on the land. We will fight in the seas. With growing confidence, we will fight in the air. We will never surrender. The press came to him. They said, are you crazy? Don't you know that you can die doing this? And people were telling him that. People are saying that we, can, we might fail in this thing. He said, why are you worried? He said, if we go, and if we win, he said, they will keep quiet. And he said, if we don't win, there will be nobody to criticize. Hallelujah. So there is no way you can beat a man who is resolved. That's why Esther did not die. Esther said, if I perish, I perish. But she did not perish. Hallelujah. Amen. Esther said, look, it is my time. God has brought me to the kingdom for this. Now I'm going to confront the king. And I know that this is at the risk of my life. But I know one thing. If I perish, I perish. But I will go down into history for standing for what I ought to have stood for. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the potential continues to be there. We must seize opportunities that are offered by new beginnings. We either seize opportunities that God has given to us and move forward, or else we will allow opportunities to pass by. Somebody said, may my opportunities not pass me by. In the mighty name of Jesus. Friends, you know something? In uh, a couple of years ago, I was at an airport in Doha, in Qatar, and uh, God spoke to me about opportunities. And that blessed me very much. He told me that opportunities are like airplanes at an airport. He said, you don't need every one of them to get to where you are going, but you need to be on time to catch yours. You need to be on time. This year is calling for sensitivity. This new year is calling for sensitivity. So what we're doing this week of new beginnings is not for you to just feast into the new year and forget about things. It's for you to start to meditate. For you to start to concentrate. For you to start to be sensitive. There are opportunities that will come your way. And you know, opportunities don't always come in packages we expect. There are some opportunities that will come your way that you must embrace from now. There are some opportunities that will come later, but God will be telling you about them. You need to be sensitive to understand what God is about to do. Amen. A man of God called Apostle Paul in the scriptures said to, 
many things to us in Philippians chapter 3, but we're going to look at some of the steps that we can take in what he said about how we can understand new beginnings. Philippians chapter 3, I want to read it from verse 7. Chapter 3 from verse 7 to verse 14, okay? So, but one thing, one thing you have gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yes, next verse. Yet, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence. Somebody say for the excellence. Yes. So you don't rest until you find the excellence of God. You don't allow yourself to settle for second best until you find the excellence of God. He said, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as what? Rubbish. That I may do what? Gain Christ. What is life? What do we gain? What do we have in life without Christ? So Paul was saying that all that we need to do is to gain Christ, to walk in the fullness of whom God has made us and whom he intends us to be. Verse 9. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in who? In Christ. The righteousness which is from God by what? By faith. Verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Verse 11. Verse 11. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. What Paul is saying is we need, I need to get my priorities in order. I have to begin with Jesus. So step one is begin with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Everything about this change and this new beginning we are talking about must be rooted in your understanding further of Christ. Hallelujah. Everyone must find a new beginning for the year ahead in Jesus in some way, shape or form. This might mean that you are coming to Jesus by way of new birth. Your first time of meeting Jesus to become your Lord and Savior. Or it might be by way of a rededication because you've had a journey that has not been as effective. Or it might just mean that you have a need to engage with the process of continuously surrendering to the will of God. Now that applies to everybody. Everybody must come to a place where you are saying, Lord, let your will be sovereign in my life. Let your will be done. This is the way you can embrace a new beginning and see change indeed. A new beginning cannot have any effect on your life if you are not willing to submit your will to his will. Amen. So it is the revelation of Jesus Christ that empowers the believer and the church. We read in Matthew chapter 16, all the way from verse 13 to 19, but I will read all of that now. And um, it said, verse 13, okay, when Jesus came, when Jesus came, Jesus came into the region of Caesarea in Philip, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who do they say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, somebody said they said. Yes. Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah and one of the prophets. Verse 15. The fundamental question that God is asking you and I in embracing new beginnings is who do you say he is? Who is Jesus to you? Is Jesus the person that came and died 2,000 years ago and is a historical figure? Or is Jesus somebody who has promised some things in scripture but you have assumed that some of the things, some of the other things he promised are not for you? Is Jesus the person you believe can truly transform your life and can truly be the one who is the same yesterday, today and forever in your life? He said, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And we know that after that, God related to Simon. As Jesus said to him, verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed to you but my Father in heaven. And verse 18, And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, on this revelation of who I am, that I will build my church. And what? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This simply means that the gates of hell will continue to challenge the things that you believe. They will continue to challenge the things that he has said. But you must hold on to that rock. He said it is a rock. The revelation is a rock. You must hold on to him. 
your knowledge of him as the son of God, the, the Christ, the son of the living God must never ever cease in your life. You must consistently, continuously proclaim it. Hallelujah. So that when the gates of hell are challenging you in February, are challenging you in June, you are saying, I belong to Christ, the Son of the living God. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. My God will supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. I will fear no evil for he is with me. He is with me always. And you continue to build your confidence, your assault on on that rock of the revelation of who he is. He will keep challenging you and keep trying to make it difficult for you to believe what you believe. But you must never let go of it. Tell your neighbor, never let go of it. Never let go of it. So it's the first thing. You must come to a place where you begin with Jesus. The second thing Paul said there is found in verses 12 and 13 of Philippians chapter 3. And he talks about it there says, not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected, but I do what? I do what? I press on that I may lay hold of that faith for which Christ has also laid hold of me. He said, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. Verse 13. Verse 12. That I may lay hold of him. Verse 13, please. He said, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting what? those things behind. Again, forgetting the things behind. Forgetting the things of old. It is such an important principle. Do you know that success is the enemy of success? Success itself, past success is the enemy of future success. If, for example, now we stand and say, oh, wow, fantastic celebrate the king. Fantastic. Thank God for it. Thank God. Fantastic. Wow. And that's all we are saying till next year. Till Christmas time. Do you know that we can scuffle the planning for the next year's event? So, thank God, you appreciate God, but you also keep pressing on to lay hold of the eternal things. Hallelujah. He said, one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind, and I reach forward to those things which are ahead. So, the second step is you must start from where you are. Embrace his plan for your life and forget any kind of setback or even achievements of the past. Only celebrate achievements of the past for the sake of thanksgiving, but don't let them be a hindrance to you embracing new things in the name of Jesus. And then in verse 14, is the third thing. He said, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. So step three is get your eyes on the prize and run for the finish line. Tell your neighbor for me, get your eyes on the prize. Get your eyes on the prize. And run for the finish line. Run for the finish line. Have you ever seen an athlete who started off a 100 meter dash, and as they said on your marks, get set, go, and then he took off, and he was leading, and he was leading, and he looked back and he noticed that, you know, he was pulled away from everybody else. And then he just decided to stop there and say, you know, and the finish line is still some 20 meters away. He said, yeah, man, you know, uh, this, is my, this is my race to win. You know what's going to happen to him? Everybody else will do what? They'll just go past him right where he stood. So whatever it is, you keep pressing towards the goal. You keep saying, Lord, my finish line is what you've shown me. My finish line is what you've said about me. My finish line is ultimately for me to make heaven. Do you know that whatever we do on earth, everything must culminate into us making heaven? Ultimately, all this, all this, the summary of all this is that one day we make heaven. That is our ultimate finish line. But while we are breasting that tape, there are patterns that we are passing on from stage to stage, from year to year. We are moving on and making progress and we must continuously put the price in our view. And may God help us all in doing that in Jesus' name. Amen. So in this new week of our uh, covenant week of new beginnings, we will be seeing the end by the grace of God of 2013 Amen. and moving prophetically into 2014. Amen. And by that reason, I have the privilege of declaring to you by the grace of God Almighty that for us, 2014 shall be our year of divine accomplishments. Amen. Divine accomplishments. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Comes from 
that verse we read. Ah, let's read it together. I all right. can do all, all things through Christ that strengthens me. me. Every one of us, God is showing me and laying on my heart that as long as we trust in Him, we will be accomplishing things that our mortal strength cannot have done. Our mortal strength could not have reached those things. But as we believe God, we will do all things through Christ who will strengthen us in our individual lives, in our families, and as a church, and as a body of Christ, in the name of Jesus. Say, 2014, 2014 shall be my year, be my year of, divine of divine accomplishments in the name of Jesus. This is why I said you need to plug yourself to the spirit of new beginnings from now. Because it will require you to take steps that you were afraid to take before. Or the ones you have taken and it seems as if things did not work. But you will take them this time. Because you can do all things through Christ that will strengthen you through them. In the name of Jesus Christ. It is therefore important for us to end 2013 by reviewing the year and our individual and corporate strides. Every one of us must ask ourselves, what did I accomplish during this year? What is left to be done? Did I fulfill the will of God for my life? With 2014 commencing, we must believe that with God, every ending is a new beginning. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Say every ending, every ending is a new beginning. A new beginning. The end of all challenges in 2013. Say the end of all challenges in 2013 signify new beginnings for me in 2014 in the name of Jesus. Every new beginning brings new opportunities. You need to be optimistic. You need to be optimistic. Again, one of the past presidents of America by name Harry Truman, this was the one that ruled after Franklin Roosevelt, just after the war, the Second World War. He said something. He said, as far as people remain pessimists, he said they will keep seeing difficulties in opportunities. Only optimists have a way of seeing opportunities in difficulties. Hallelujah. I wish I could stand and tell you that the world systems and the things around us will be better. But the truth is, if you are about my age, you will know that it has never been better ever since we've been growing up. Amen. So we don't wish it better per se in that way. But rather what we pray is that God helps us to continue to embrace the challenges and doing all things through Christ that will strengthen us. And so shall it be in Jesus' name. Amen. Life does not always throw better things. Young people hear me. The challenges we faced when we were your age are not the challenges you are facing now. When I was 15, there was no internet. Yeah, where would I get it? So to get pornographic material, I would have to travel to places where people have magazines and they hit them under the bed. Nobody was safe with them. But today, you can come to your phone. You have to say, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I reject you in Jesus' name. I throw out that app. If one app is flashing it to you every time, don't say you minimize it. What do you do with it? Destroy it. Delete. 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 <laughs> Uninstall. No long story. You have to fight the good fight of faith. You have to embrace the challenge of today and say, I will fight with God on my side, not allowing anything to truncate my destiny. We didn't have access to credit cards. These days, you can have access to credit cards as an 18, 17, 18 year old. And just be spending money like water. <laughs> and be irresponsible from that age. But you can decide that you will make everything with the wisdom of God. But you know the same thing. The level of the word of God you are hearing now. And the opportunities of the message that is all around. Was not also available to us in our time. So you have a lot of things to help you. Hallelujah. Couples, the pressure are much more now. We have to stay with God and decide that we need to set goals for the new year. Look at new opportunities. 
New opportunities mean new incentives to act. New opportunities mean setting fresh goals. Ask yourself, in my physical life, what can I do to improve my health? In my educational life, what do I need to learn? It was Chris Morley that said, learning, earning, and yearning are the three ingredients of life. You have to keep learning, earning, and yearning, and then you start learning again so that you can earn more, and then you yearn, then you learn. When you learn, you discover the things you don't know. Then you start learning. And then when you learn, you discover that you are earning more. Then you learn again. Hallelujah. Till Jesus comes. In the job I'm doing here now, I have to keep learning. If I don't learn, we will not leave this level. So I have to keep learning. I have to keep earning so that I can hear. And every time we must commit to education. Education is not about getting a certificate. It is about training yourself to be relevant. Somebody said the vast information and the knowledge of the world is doubling every 10 years. So if what you know 10 years ago is just what you know now, or you know just about you know half of it more, then that means you are already behind by about five years. And then you become irrelevant. Somebody said, I will not be relevant. You need to be disciplined. What bad habits do I need to conquer? Friends, habits can either make you or mar you. You have to choose the ones that are making you. Let go of the habits that are trying to mar your testimony. Let go. And you know, you know, it, it is said that it is your thoughts that become your actions. Your actions become your habits, and then your habits form your character. So if you notice that a habit is good, tra- trace it back to the thoughts. There are, is a thought that is controlling that habit. And when you can address that thought, that is what the Bible calls pulling down strong bones, casting down image, emotions. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. These are the kind of thoughts that you need to deal with so that your habits can be godly and they can lead you to a godly character in the mighty name of Jesus. You look at your relationship. What relationship do I want to see healed and restored? What relationship do I need to break off? Not every relationship always has to continue. And I'm not asking you to look at your brother or your sister next to you now or your husband or your wife. That's not what I'm talking about. There are some relationships you have out there, they weigh down your faith, they are not helping your faith. You call him Bobby, but Bobby he don't, he's not helping you. Bobby do not help you at all. Every time you meet Bobby, he is telling you about things that will not take you anywhere. So you say, Bobby, I love you very much, but we're going to have a little distance between us. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. What relationship do I need to strengthen? There are some relationships you have to labor to keep because they are good for you. There are some people I make effort to keep in touch with because they are so far from me. If I don't make the effort, I won't be in touch with them. They don't need me, I need them. (laughs) So there are some relationships you have to keep making the effort. You will call them and then they will be feeling bad that they've not spoken to you in months. And you will say, don't worry, that I even can speak to you now, I'm happy. (laughs) It's enough for me, I'm happy. Hallelujah. Because it is beneficial to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your career, what is God's will for your life? Friends, knowing God's will is like the valve that allows the supply of grace into your life. When you know what God wants for you, you release grace into your life in a unique way. Hallelujah. So you need to know God's will. You need to know what God is saying. Marriage, what can I do to be a better husband or wife? Can I hear an amen? Amen. Can I hear an amen from the husbands and wives in the house? Amen. You need to make up your mind. Don't say she needs to change or he needs to change. I know the solution to this family, he needs to change. And don't point. You point to yourself. Say, I need to change. Come on, say, I need to change. God told me a few months before my marriage, he said, you can make your marriage a prison or a paradise. It is your choice. A couple of years ago, he told me, he said, there is no marriage made in heaven. Wise couples only walk with me to make a heaven of their marriage. People will say, you see those guys? Their marriage is made in heaven. There is no marriage made anywhere in heaven. People only are wise to make God the Lord of their home. And then God makes their marriage a heaven. Hallelujah. Parents, what can I do to become a better father or mother? What can I do in my family to make our home a place of love and peace? Ask yourself these questions financially. What must I do to meet my financial obligations and achieve my financial goals? Because as we'll be praying and prophesying for 2014, it will require you to take some steps. It will require you to take some actions. And as you are meditating in this covenant new week of new beginnings, it will begin to be clear to you what you need to do. And the Bible will say, and the prophecy came, and then God will say, stretch forth your rod, go and bring forth the pots, 
go and do something. So you need to start to ask God, what are the actions I need to take so that the prophetic word that is coming my way to make 2014 my year of divine accomplishment will come to pass. May God grant you the insights in the mighty name of Jesus. I round up by saying this. As a church, we have a duty to continue to equip the saints and prepare everyone for the work of the ministry according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Our proposed strategy over the coming month will then be as follows. January 2014 will be our season of foundational empowerment. Can I hear an amen? amen. And put your hands together. Amen. amen. So it will really mean that we are committing to serious business. January is a serious month. Every month will be serious, but we are committing to serious business. We are fasting from the 3rd to the 23rd of January 2014. And I want to encourage everybody to be a part of this. Now, if you have never fasted before, I will ask you to seek counsel as to what you ought to do. If you are a fasting machine, you will start as usual and carry on. <laughs> carry on what you know how best to do. But if you have never fasted before, we need to let you know what it entails and what you should be doing. And if you have a medical condition that will preclude you from fasting, which would mean that you cannot stay for long hours without eating, please by all means make sure you eat as you ought to eat. But be in the spirit of what we are doing. Fasting draws you closer to God. Fasting has a way of making God come into your life. And we're going to be praying especially about the fasting in the months, uh, in the different times on Wednesdays and Fridays as God helps us. And we'll be telling you what the different weeks will be so that every time you are fasting, you know what you are supposed to be praying and how you are supposed to be functioning. We will finish the fasting on the 23rd of January, which is a Thursday. By the grace of God, on Friday, the 24th of January, please mark this date in your calendar. It's supposed to be our victory prayer night day. We will be having the Occupy 2014 seminar. Amen. Amen. It will start from 8 p.m. and go right to midnight. The mandate upon the life of every person is to occupy till he comes. So Occupy 2014 will help you reinforce your own placement in destiny. What this means is that God will be revealing to you the things that you need to do, the things that you need to be able to appreciate and you need to lay hold of in order for you to be living an effective life in all that you are going to do in 2014. And everyone will gain spiritual insight into their purpose and how to leverage the prophetic declaration of God's intention for the year. May God cause you to shine in 2014. Yeah. As we celebrate Him for bringing us to the end of 2013, God will cause your life to be celebrated in 2014. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I want you to connect to the atmosphere, the spirit in the atmosphere. God is said to do new things. I would like you to rise to your feet right now. And uh, I thank you for your time and your patience. I know.